Sounds like I'm doing an educational thing. Uh, well, good morning, or good afternoon, I guess it is. Um, I am Jay Jones. I'm with Home Instead Senior Care. I'm a home care specialist, um, but I'm a former hospital administrator, which means I really don't know much. But I know a lot of people who know things, so um, I make them available to me as often as possible. Uh, I was asked today to talk about managing difficult behaviors, and I want this to be as interactive as possible. So if you have some specific examples or some issues that you'd like to have addressed directly, I'm tickled to death to be able to do that. I'm going to share with you some of my own family stories um, so that you can see where I got my experience in dealing with people with difficult behaviors. Um, they say insanity uh, runs in some families. In mine, it gallops. So it's, uh, it's making fast time. Um, <clears throat> and it gave me the opportunity to learn how to, to deal with individuals um, who are difficult to deal with. So we're talking about Alzheimer's primarily, um, and I will encourage you to, to uh, understand that there's no T in the word Alzheimer's. Um, it was, uh, Dr. Alzheimer's was the one that actually gets credit for it, but he was not the one that discovered the disease. Actually, somebody else did, but he got credit because he delivered the paper. So you know the person who delivers the paper is the one they name it after, and so that's why we call it that. It could be Jones disease, but it's not, it's Alzheimer's. Uh, it makes up about 85-90% of all dementia. Um, the rest of dementias are made up by various and sundry other things. There's totally, uh, we know of five. Uh, basically, vascular uh, dementia is one of those, uh, something that comes as a result of a stroke. Um, and then you have Lewy body, which uh, is beginning to become a lot more uh, obvious to people. Robin Williams had Lewy body um, dementia. Um, and then um, you have something that's called FTP, which is frontotemporal. Um, and that's uh, beginning to pick up the nickname the NFL disease. And the reason it is is simply because these guys keep beating their heads deep together. Mm -hmm. And think of your brain as being uh, essentially um, like a, a jello. And um, it sits in a bowl and it kind of quivers when you hit your head. But if you hit it often enough, it begins to do something that's called an axonal shift. And when it does that, things that line up perfectly no longer line up perfectly. And so you begin to have issues because things that memories begin to cross and all of a sudden you took a trip that you never took, something that you saw on television and you tell people, I, did, I, I was there once and the rest of the family looks at one another and goes, huh? Well, mom, you've never been there. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we went there for vacation one year. Don't you remember? No, none of us remember that. Um, so uh, that kind of thing happens in, in uh, head injuries of all sorts where an individual uh, has a trauma to the head. Uh, Cam Newton, you guys know Cam Newton? Uh, within, uh, what, four football games now that he's played, he's, he has had at least six head injuries in the last four ball games that he's played. And I'll put money on the table right now that'll tell you within 10 years he'll be showing signs of dementia. Now, that's the reason why the NFL says you're not supposed to target people, but until they start calling the targeting flags, which they have not been calling, which is the reason why Cam got knocked out about five or six times in those games. Um, as long as you get away with it, they're going to keep doing it. So um, that said, it creates difficult behaviors. Um, and so the difficult behaviors themselves are things that need to be managed only when it becomes a problem that puts you at risk or the individual at risk. That's when you really need to get into managing those kinds of behaviors. So uh, the list here that we're going by, this is kind of an abridged version of what we teach at Home Instead Senior Care to all of our caregivers. Uh, they must go through a four-hour training uh, program that's put on by the staff uh, on managing or, or uh, dealing with Alzheimer's individuals, and that's one of our specialties. Uh, one of the, uh, for 20 years now we've been doing this, so we're, we got pretty good at it. So the, the behaviors that we're talking about uh, are things such as aggression or anger, and we see aggression and anger a lot. Um, uh, things happen where things, um, events occur where things happen that are out of the ordinary. Uh, some of it though falls in what happens to us when we get older. So as I get older, I get less testosterone in my body. Uh, women on the other hand get more testosterone. So as a result of that, women become more aggressive as they get older than men do. Men become more calm uh, as they have more estrogen in their body. Okay, that's a, that's a biological fact. That's just what happens to us when we get older. Now you put on top of that a head injury and your most difficult individual to manage 
um, that, that has a head injury or uh, has Alzheimer's or any kind of dementia, uh, you put the extra testosterone on top of that, and all of a sudden you begin to see some physical acting out and some anger and those kinds of things. Um, and, and typically when people get this way, there's a need that has not been met, and it's your job to try to figure out what that need is. Uh, and that's, all, that's a challenge, but the longer you're with the individual, the more it becomes apparent that means I need to go to the bathroom, that means I need something to drink, that means I'm sitting here uncomfortable, that means I'm bored silly, I need to go exercise, and those kinds of things. Uh, so you've got to figure out what that is. Anxiety and agitation are a couple of more of, the, of those that, the kinds of things that need to be uh, managed. And then the next thing, on, as you turn the page, you'll see delusions and hallucinations. And this is the most difficult of all of them because what we tend to want to do is we tend to want to talk the person out of their hallucination. And it never works. We fail every single time. Um, and, and the reason we fail is because we have, to them, it's very real. To us, it is not real. If we step inside their illusion, whatever it is that they're seeing, and we find a common ground, we can typically walk them out of that delusion. <laughs> whatever it is. So let me give you an example, uh, talking about my family. My brother, um, who's five years older than I am, uh, was involved in a motor vehicle accident many years ago and slid across the pavement for about 40 yards um, after head, I mean, his head hit repeatedly, so he has a brain injury. Um, the brain injury has been uh, diagnosed as schizophrenia, so he has a combination of schizophrenia and a brain injury. And uh, my brother from time to time uh, would have issues. And, and one day I received a phone call when I was at the hospital and he said, uh, the police are coming to get me. Now my brother lives in Little Rock and I'm of course here in Birmingham. And I said, okay, so what for? And he said, well, for the murder. And I said, oh goodness, did you witness a murder? He said, no, I murdered someone. And I said, and the police are coming to get you. And um, he said, yeah, and, and so at that particular point, I was not well trained and I didn't know exactly what to do, but luckily enough as a hospital administrator at Lakeshore Rehab Hospital, I had a neuropsychologist on staff that I could run down to his office and say, help, what do I do? So he gives me a couple of strategies. He's the one that introduced me to the whole notion of stepping inside of the illusion and then walking out of it with the individual. So I went back and picked up the telephone and called my brother back who's in Little Rock and I said, uh, Butch, which is uh, conveniently what I call him, uh, Butch, um, let me, uh, the, the chief of police uh, in Little Rock is a really good friend of mine. He went to high school with me. Uh, let me call him and see if I can find out what this is about. Now, I just did something that we call a fibet. Little fibets, and because basically I don't know who the police chief is in Little Rock. Certainly not somebody I went to high school with. But I sold my brother on the notion that I knew who this guy was and I could get some inside information. So uh, I let about 30 minutes go by and I finally called him back and I said, okay, I talked with him. And here's what we've discovered. They are looking for a Don Jones, but I gave him a physical description that was completely different than my brother's description. So I acknowledged that the police were looking for Don Jones, but I helped him understand they were not looking for him as Don Jones. Uh, we've probably done that about six or eight times over the last five years, still continues. Um, and, when, and I use the same thing because I'm not smart enough to create a, a second line. I've got this one, it's working, I'm going with it. Um, and, and he calms down and he says, oh, okay, so it's another Don Jones they're looking for. Now, I haven't tried to dig into the, the murder thing. Um, did he see it on TV one day and think he was involved? I have no clue. With a head injury individual, that's very possible. Certainly with a person who's schizophrenic, um, they think the radio's talking to them, they think the television's talking to them. Um, and people with Alzheimer's sometimes will be watching TV um, and that will kindle a memory that didn't actually happen. It might have been on another program and they'll start talking about something that happened to them five years ago with these same people. And, and so you're having to deal with a way of getting that person out of that reality. The worst thing that you can do is argue with them. Doesn't work. Has anybody tried that? Has anybody tried arguing? Yeah, was it successful? No, not at all. You know, you might as well just pick up a rock and beat your head like that with it because that's all you're really doing. Um, but it feels good because you feel like that's the thing you're supposed to do. But if you can find a way to step inside that reality and acknowledge that that's what they see, feel, or hear. 
I'll tell you another quick story about that. Uh, anybody have little children? Anybody ever have little children? Yeah, okay. I ask that a little differently, don't I? Uh, uh, so uh, when, uh, uh, when one of my uh, small uh, children would go to bed at night, uh, guess what's underneath the bed? Yeah, monsters of some kind are underneath the bed. Every child, not every child, but most child, most kids have that kind of stuff happening to them. And so he was afraid to go to bed, and it was kind of like, well, did you look under the bed? And I said, oh, I got something better. I had gone to uh, the store and bought me one of those little squeeze bottles, those misting kind of things, and I filled it with water, and I wrote on the outside of it, monster spray. And so when it was time to go to bed, I walked around underneath this bed going like this. I said, this stuff is so effective. Monsters won't even come close to it. He'd lay down and go to sleep. We did that for about two or three weeks. That last week, I only did it once. He forgot totally about the monsters under his bed. So I acknowledged his anxiety that the monsters are down there, but I have something to treat it with to make sure that they don't get you. So it works for... Older folks, as well as with dementia, as well as it does with younger children or younger individuals. Uh, we still use those, those kinds of things, um, some of the others that we're going to talk to. But understand that these things are fixed in their mind. And if it's fixed in a person's mind, for example, sitting in a chair and they see a little bit of movement and all of a sudden they look out the window and there's a man standing over there. Well, you look out the window and you don't see a thing. You can argue with them about whether there's a man standing out the window, outside the window, or you can step inside that reality and say, oh, that's the gardener. Or that's the power company guy. They're checking the lines to make sure the tree limbs don't fall on top of them. He'll be gone in just a few minutes. You've stepped into the reality. You've acknowledged what's going on, and you've walked them out of that. You've managed that behavior. The next one is refusal. Refusal is one of the, the things that we do when we want to try to gain control. That's a control mechanism. So you refuse to eat, you refuse to drink, you refuse to go to the bathroom, you refuse to take a shower. I love that one. That's my favorite. You know, most people say, are you ready for your shower? And what's the answer? No. No. I don't need a shower. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> take it from somebody standing two feet away from you. You need a shower. So what are the strategies that you can do to get somebody to to uh, want to get in the shower. Well, the first thing that I encourage you to do is to assume that it's going to happen. Don't ask their permission. Just assume you're going to do it and they're going to do it with you. Second thing I would encourage you to do, based on my experience at Lakeshore, at Lakeshore, we, the nurses would come into your room and they'd help you get out of bed and they'd strip you down to nothing and then wrap you up in a sheet and they'd roll you into the shower room and then turn the water on and what, what water comes out first? Always. The cold water, good cold water, because that's exactly what you want to do. have to enjoy your shower. I, I used to kid them that that was part of their therapy to see how fast they could get out of that room because it was so cold, but um, they you know, have to give people showers. So uh, what some of the folks started doing is they would have the water running before they ever got the individual into the room. And depending on the individual, they wouldn't take their clothes off of them until they got into the room. And in some cases, They'd get just enough off that they could quickly get the rest of them off and get them in there. And I know of cases where they've taken showers with their, um, their undergarments on. You know, if he's not going to pull his boxer shorts off, get them wet. You got a dryer. <laughs> get another pair ready, you know, because that's just his way of trying to, to have some kind of control over what's going on in his life. No, I'm not going to do it. So you do something um, that has been dubbed the Just Right Challenge. And the just right challenge for the individual is to find a reason to make it work for them. So if you're talking about a shower, don't ask them if they want to go get a shower. Go get the shower started. Turn it on, make sure the temperature is the way it's supposed to be. People with dementia have difficulty sometimes with the origin of things. So when they get to the shower, as they start to step into the shower, they have no clue where the water's coming from. They can see it in front of them, but they can't they're not making that connection that it's coming out of this pipe up here. So easing a hand into the shower first and letting them become accustomed to it and letting them kind of see what the water feels like and then encouraging them to get the rest of the way on in is a good way to manage an individual getting into the shower. You didn't ask them if they wanted to take a shower. You just say, hey, let's go. 
And the let's go sometimes is, okay, where are we going? Let me show you. You're going to really, really like this. And you just keep talking, and you don't talk about the fact you're going to take a shower until you get in the bathroom, you got the door closed. Hello, gotcha. <laughs> so that's a great way to deal with refusal. Uh, water is the same way if you've got somebody that's having difficulty not uh, hydrating enough and you need to get them to, to have something to drink. It could be the drink of choice. Uh, it could be that you're trying to get them to drink water and they really want a Diet Coke. Or it could be that the, they, uh, you're trying to get them to drink a Diet Coke and they'd rather have a cup of coffee. It may be that you have to try several things in order to find out what it is that they are wanting but they'll refuse just to have a little bit of control. And once they exercise that control and get what it is that they're hoping to have, then you have a compliant individual, typically. Um, repetition and fixation. Um, typically marked by things, uh, a real good example that we use when we're talking to our caregivers is an example that says um, at three o'clock, the gentleman gets up, walks to the kitchen and says, what are we having, di what are we having dinner? The caregiver says, well, we're going to have dinner about 6 o'clock. Great. I'm looking forward to it. And then he'll go back and sit down doing his puzzle or whatever he's doing. And a few minutes later, he's back in the kitchen going, what do we have, when are we having supper? And you're thinking to yourself, I just told you 10 minutes ago that it's going to be at 6. But you have to play the game and you have to repeat it. Is 6 o'clock okay with you? Yeah, yeah, 6 is great. I'll be good and hungry by then. He'll go back in, sit down, and you might do this five or six times before 6 o'clock gets there. And at some particular point, you might even say, it appears to me that you're hungry now. Would you rather eat right now? Would this be a good time? Um, because frequently you'll get the answer of, yes, I'm really hungry. Okay, well, let's eat now. Uh, you may have sandwiches that you're uh, preparing or, or those kinds of things. Um, uh, with head injuries, you get something that's called perseveration. And perseveration is uh, one of those phenomenons where the person repeats the question over and over. So you typically see it in an emergency room, but you will also see it in your home from time to time when the individual will ask the question. And the, it's the same question over and over, but they're, they're ganged real close together. So in an emergency room, it might be something like, uh, where am I? Well, you're in the emergency room. What for? You were in a car accident. Oh, okay. Well, where am I? You're in the emergency room. Well, why am I in the emergency room? Because you had a car accident. Oh. And that may play over and over and over again. But typically what you're going to get is people asking questions that they asked a little while ago. And we'll talk about a couple of strategies to work with that on how to get them deflected onto something else um, where you change the focus. And you change the focus by bringing something else up that gets their attention and gets their mind off of it. Um, ever had a small child fall down and get a boo-boo? And if you go all nuts over it, the child just goes crazy as well. And if you go, oh, are you all right? and not make a big deal about it, then the child typically doesn't make a big deal about it. Or you change their focus, ow, that had to hurt. Let's get some ice cream. You know, uh, my child would fall down every five seconds if I told him that was the answer. <laughs> He'd do that on purpose. Oh, I'm down, more ice cream. Um, so um, those are the kinds of things that you, uh, that you can do uh, where you change the focus. So you might have an individual um, who is um, repeating themselves over and over and, uh, well, I, I've got to see my daughter. I've, I've just really got to see my daughter. I, I, I really I, I need to see my daughter. Uh, you might try one of those little fibettes. Well, I think she's coming here later tonight. How about we watch Days of Our Lives on television? And all of a sudden, we're not talking about our daughter. We're talking about Days of Our Lives on TV. And you've changed the subject, and you've gotten off of that point of fixation. So that's a strategy. Sexual inappropriateness almost always happens when you're dealing with men they are 18 uh, to 35 years old. And that's because the filter comes off, comes completely off. Same thing happens when you have somebody with dementia. The filter comes off. That's a sweet little old lady uh, that we took care of. And for, she insisted on um, running around nude in her house. That's the way she was comfortable. Um, the caregiver was fine with it. And so that's the way it was done, except for when I came to check on them to see how she was doing. And then we had to coax her into a robe because it's hard to have a conversation with somebody standing naked in front of you when you're not. I mean, you know, if you've tried that before, don't raise your hands. It's okay. Um, yeah, a couple of you started, had hands started going up. Um, so, uh, so what happens is uh, it was inappropriate. That kind of, uh, to me, it was inappropriate. 
Um, and so we would have to, to, again, talk her into a robe. So I would make sure the caregiver knew that I was coming, what time I arrived, um, so that just a few minutes before that, the, she would lay the, the robe out uh, on the chair, and when she heard me knock on the door, she'd get her in the robe, because this woman's only going to be in this robe for just a very few minutes. There was no way to get her um, to stay in that robe, um, at least not at the time that we were uh, there taking care of her. Uh, and as soon as I left, she came out of her robe. Same thing happens with guys. Um, you have uh, gentlemen who uh, will get up out of bed uh, wearing their boxer shorts and will refuse to get dressed and they'll walk around in their boxers all day long. And you gotta figure out a way to get some pants on them because it's not particularly polite. Um, especially when somebody comes to the door, the pizza guy comes in the door and he opens the door standing there in his boxer shorts. Uh, I have a child with um, Asperger's um, and uh, he did not like the feeling of clothes on his body. So he wore boxer shorts all the time. That's all he wore. And people who came to my house were forewarned that I have a child running around in his boxer shorts. He would call and order a pizza sometimes, and the pizza guy would come to the door, and he'd go to the door to the pizza guy, and the two of them would do their transaction with my son and his boxers and the guy doing the pizza. You know, and I just told the pizza people, I'm sorry. You know, that's the best I can do. I can't get him dressed because the tactile sensation of the pants on his legs was very painful to him. Um, he, he's much better now. He's like 24 and it's not as bad as he was when he was an 11, 12, 13 year old kid, but he was pretty tough back then. Um, so the filter comes off. And the way to get around the filter is the same thing that you do when you're talking about the repetition. It's the change the focus. Move the focus to something else. Get them thinking about something other than what's on their mind. Uh, for men, the older the man is, a, a man with uh, Alzheimer's is going to want to touch inappropriately or might say things that are inappropriate, um, and you just have to suffer through that and then get uh, the direction going someplace different. Talk about, you know, what are we going to have for lunch or what are we going to have for breakfast or, or those kinds of things. Wandering is one of those that nobody knows exactly why somebody wanders, um, but if they get into harm's way, you've got to be able to change the dynamic so that they're not wandering. So we took care of an individual. Um, we called him Houdini. We love this guy. Um, but he would just disappear off of the unit. Um, and we had people whose job was to, you know, y'all keep your eye out for him because when he goes out, he's out. Um, what we discovered was uh, he was found every single time walking the perimeter of the hospital. So uh, one of our physical therapists said, hmm, maybe he needs exercise. So they decided to add to his uh, daily regime um, uh, PT uh, added uh, an opportunity for him to get up and walk. So he would get up. Sometimes they would take him outside and walk with him. If the weather was inclement, they'd put him on a treadmill. Changed the whole, the whole dynamic. He stopped wandering. He needed exercise. He needed to burn some energy. So if you have somebody that is a wanderer, you also have to have an environmental plan. And the environmental plan means you've got to figure out a way to make sure that, that door stays closed, that those windows stay closed. If you've got a gas stove, that the gas knobs can't be turned on. If you've got a gas dryer, you've got to make sure the dryer can't be turned on. We had one gentleman who thought his dryer was his uh, trash can, and he would throw plastic from his, he loved ho-hos, and he would throw the wrappers and the ho-hos into the dryer. And then, you know, if you didn't check that dryer very, very carefully, all it takes is about three or four turns and that plastic is burned into the, to the dryer itself. Um, so we had to come up with a strategy and our strategy was just to flip the breaker. It wouldn't come on. So the staff knew that you know, when, you, when you did dry uh, clothes for this individual, you check the dryer first and then you go flip the breaker and then you run the dryer. When you're finished with it, you go back down and flip the breaker. It stayed off except when somebody was there using it. So that's part of the environmental plan. Um, if you have somebody, had a gentleman that liked to cook at night because he was hungry or he thought he was cooking, and he would um, take uh, a pan of, uh, of eggs and he would put water in there and he'd set it on the fire, he'd turn on the gas, and he'd walk away and completely forget that he'd even done that. Had no memory of doing that. And of course the water after a while boils away and now you've got two eggs that are sitting in there and that heat is still hitting that pan and you're going to have problems when those eggs break. Um, not to mention the potential of a fire. Um, so what we came up with that particular one, we just took the knobs <coughs> off the stove. At night when you go to bed, you just pull the knobs off, or when, when there wasn't somebody there taking care of him, you just pull the knobs off the, off the stove. 
<coughs> and then the individual doesn't have the ability to turn the stove on. Um, so that's all part of the environmental plan, uh, locking doors and making sure that they stay locked and, and, and those kinds of things. Uh, next on our list, turning the page, I'm, I'm just kind of using this. Um, and again, uh, most of these things that are listed here are, um, are underscoring that the individual has a particular need that they have, and you got to get down to the bottom uh, of what it is that they want. A lot of people, as they progress through Alzheimer's uh, and, and other dementias, will o only have the ability to, to use gestures to communicate, especially if you have somebody that has a vascular uh, stroke, has had a vascular stroke, um, and they've lost their ability at speech and communication. Uh, Alzheimer's is the same way. The first place Alzheimer's attacks is the speech language communication uh, part of your brain. That's the first place it attacks. So the first thing that goes is nouns. So you have somebody who's in the middle of talking and they can't remember the name of, for example, the treadmill. And so instead of telling you that they wanted to get on the treadmill, they'll tell you they want to get on that thing, you know, it goes like this, and they'll describe it to you. Or um, I have a good friend of mine um, who is on a Lamenda patch. And, you know, you change those things frequently. And so he was about to go take a shower, and he was looking for his Lamenda patch, and he couldn't find it anywhere. And so I was sitting there in the room with him, and, and I said, hey, looks like we've got a treasure hunt going. Can I play? I didn't say, would you lose? I didn't say, you know, you're having trouble finding something. I wanted to, to make it more of a positive statement. So I said, looks like we're doing a treasure hunt. Would you lose? And he said, well, uh, that thing that I, you know, the thing that I put on. And that's all he could do. He could just draw the patch. And, of course, I knew from what he was drawing that he was looking for his patch. And I said, well, can I play too? Can I look? He said, yeah, sure. And so I went behind him looking. And you can imagine if you've ever used a dop kit. Um, Y'all know what a dop kit is? Everybody know what a dop kit is? You know, those little things that fold open like that and you keep your toiletries in them? Well, when he did, when he put his hands down in there, he put his thumbs in and he pulled it apart like that. And when he did, he, he, the patch was actually under his thumb. But he looked down and he couldn't see it in his dop kit. Now, when I went over the dop kit, I just opened it from the top. I didn't stick my thumb down in it. And, of course, it fell right in front of me. So I got the golden uh, prize because I found the Lamenda patch. Um, now, between that episode and just moments later, he couldn't remember the name of a towel. So now he's looking at me and he's going, okay, there's one more thing. And I said, what is it? He said, I can't find my, um, uh, well, you know, it, this thing. And I said, you want for your towel? He said, yeah, my, my towel. And I said, I'm looking in the mirror and I can see the reflection and it's right there on the bedpost right by, you know, with arms reach of me. And I said, uh, can you see it on the bedpost over here? And he turned his head and he said, oh, yeah, it's right there. I said, see, you need to stop looking at me. Um, you try to make it as, as light as you possibly can because it's easier for everybody. So he goes into the bathroom, takes his shower, comes out, brushes his teeth. Everything is forgotten. He has no memory whatsoever of that incident. And that's because with Alzheimer's, it's the short-term memory that's significantly affected and not the long-term memory. So the short-term memory, things that have happened within the last 24 hours, things that have happened within the last maybe five, six, ten years, those things are, are gone. Neuropsychologists can't tell you exactly why. Um, we're really not sure how we make memories. Some people say it's a whole lot th like throwing things at the wall and if it sticks, it's a memory. Um, that's a real simplification. Can you believe me using something like that that's so simple? Um, but if it slides down and lands on the floor, it no longer became a memory. And so the theory with people with dementia is that when the memory enters the brain, it's like hitting Teflon and it's not sticking and it's just, it just diminishes. So they've completely forgotten. So the worst thing that you can say to somebody that has uh, Alzheimer's is, don't you remember? And people do it all the time. Hey, do you remember then? And you can hear them do it at church where you know, they've forgotten that they're talking to somebody that has Alzheimer's because he does so well at church, and somebody will walk up and say, hey, Phil, do you remember me? <laughs> and Phil's going, no way. <laughs> uh, and he doesn't um, until you prompt him. So you might say, well, I'm Bob. You and I did such and such together. <clears throat> we took our kids, and we went to the beach. He said, oh, yeah, Bob, how are you? Now, 
I have no way of telling whether Phil actually remembers Bob or if he's just playing along. But it makes Phil feel a lot better. Uh, one of the things that we noticed as a congregation about Phil's particular problem was that when we gathered in the Great Hall before the service would start, um, two things. One, Phil used to play the guitar, and we had gathering music by something we call the Arnold Street Band. And the gathering music would just kind of provide people an opportunity to literally gather. We'd sing a few songs and, and, and that kind of thing. Well, he forgot the chords. He, he forgot where the chords were. And then uh, it wasn't totally forgetting, but he was slow in responding and getting from one chord to the next chord. So he lagged behind what the rest of us were playing. So we noticed it there. The other place we noticed it is that when everybody was in the group talking, he was standing at the doorway, leaning up against the doorway, just smiling and looking at people and just you know watching what's going on. And it was because he couldn't hear. He couldn't hear what was being said because with Alzheimer's, it doesn't just diminish the, the volume. It all of a sudden cuts out some of the words that the individual can hear. So they may hear every third, fifth, seventh, ninth word and it's hard to understand a discussion when you're trying to talk to somebody and you need all those words to make that thing work. So I'd encourage you when you're talking with somebody with Alzheimer's is to use short phrases. Get rid of all the commas and the you know, semicolons and things like that. Uh, don't be like St. Paul and do these great big long sentences that take an entire page. You know, Do, do short kinds of things uh, because it's much easier for the individual to understand. Um, so, um, we also talk about dignity and respect. Um, Alzheimer's is a disease, and it's something that happens to you. It's not like you ask it to happen. Um, you know, there's an argument out there that people that have alcohol-induced dementia caused it themselves. Well, that's blaming the victim because most of them are alcoholics and they've had way too much alcohol in their lifetime, uh, and the dementia is a result of that. Um, and, and so, talking about dignity and respect, uh, especially when we talk to our staff, we say to them, remember who this person was. You know, he, he may have been the president of the bank. May have been, you know, one of the most intelligent people you've ever met. He taught at UAB and was, you know, one of the one, top three or four uh, on the faculty there. Um, and, and so remember, that's the person you're speaking to. And always assume that they can hear what you're saying. Always assume that. And I'm going to give you some communication tips here in a few minutes, but the best way to communicate, can I move? Is it okay? Can you follow me right over here? The best way to communicate with, with anybody, if you want to get the communication clear, is to get down on their level. We see eye to eye on whatever it is I'm going to say. We may not agree, but we see eye to eye. So if you have somebody that's in a wheelchair, if you have somebody that's just sitting down because it's difficult for them to get up, when you get down to this level, do you all remember transactional analysis? Anybody remember that? Well, now we're doing adult adult. That's what we're doing right now is adult adult. When I stand up here, we're doing teacher student, which could put you in your child. So you'd want to avoid a dynamic where there's a step between you and the person that you're speaking with. So if you get down to the same level or get up to the same level, uh, the same goes true. If you're sitting down, the person walks in the room and you're trying to have a conversation with them, stand up and have the conversation because they will understand you better. You'll see a lot of lip reading going on. Um, that's typically for people who can't hear and not just people who have difficulty with words being dropped out of the conversation. Um, and for some reason or other, uh, men have a lot of trouble hearing women. The reason that's there is because most men lose hearing in the higher registers um, as they get older. Whereas women, on the other hand, lose in the lower. So y'all have trouble understanding us. We have under trouble understanding you, but we've talked fine to each other. Guy to guy, you can hear me probably just as well as anybody. But if I'm talking man to woman or, or woman uh, to, to man, there's a difference in what our, our brain actually perceives in the hearing. So you have to figure out if that's going on and you have to, to stay, step away from it. But remember the dignity and the respect. Remember who the person was. Um, especially if you're dealing with uh, the pastor of your church, um, who, um, and I'm not saying this is the case here, but the pastor of your church who all of a sudden is, is diagnosed with 
uh, dementia, and the diagnosis comes because there's been some acting out behavior that's preceded the diagnosis. Alzheimer's is the most insidious disease we have because by the time you figure out the individual has the disease, they've had it for about a year to a year and a half. Most of us will sit with our siblings or with friends and have these little funny stories. Do you notice mama did such and such? You know, she was doing that with me. And all of a sudden, you've got a couple of people are recognizing that mama put the car keys in the freezer and the ice bin, and why did she do that? There's no logical reason, I mean, I don't, even if the key was hot, there's no <laughs> logical reason to, to do that. And then once you get that piece, you begin to add a whole bunch of other stuff to it. And all of a sudden, people are looking at it and go, okay, mom's got a problem, dad's got a problem. Well, the first thing you do if mom or dad's got a problem is you rule out any medical issue. Because so many dementia cases, so many cases that appear to be dementia are actually medical issues that need to be resolved. Uh, UTI is a great example. Uh, ladies, I'm sorry for that. Uh, that's typically something that y'all have that us guys don't have. And when you get it and you have any kind of other illness, a lot of women end up in the emergency room because not only do they have discomfort and pain, but they're acting demented, if that is a good word. They're having weird things going on. Another thing that causes weird things that going on is medication content contraindications. So you're taking some medications that aren't working together very well, and you're, you've forgotten whether you were supposed to take your water pill, or if you took your water pill, so you take another one. So now you've had taken two, and then an hour later you've forgotten that you've taken one, so you take three, and all of a sudden you're completely dehydrated. Well, dehydration is another one of those things that causes the, the individual to, to act as if they're a little weird. So you've got to rule out all of the physical things before you go um, do uh, the testing for whether it's actually dementia or early cognitive disease, uh, whatever way that they want to call it. For my money, the best person to diagnose that is a neuropsychologist. That's what they're trained for. Um, their whole training is at uh, diagnosing cognitive issues. Now, psychiatrists do it, neurologists do it, a lot of family practice physicians do it. So, I mean, there are a lot of people out there that can do it, um, but I, I like my neuropsychologist and, and would highly recommend them. Um, so there's a list here of some of the other things uh, that cause um, health-related issues that can cause uh, sim uh, symptoms like, le like that. Pain could be one of those as well. So we're going to flip over here because time is running on and talk about the redirect. The redirect um, is one of the strategies that you'll do and that's the one where you refocus the person. Now you remember me talking to you a little while ago about the Fibets? They are your friend. A Fibet is a friend, but be careful with your fibets because uh, you might find yourself in a, situ a situation where you have to add to your fib and add to your fib before you can get the desired results. And if you start mixing your fibets, you could cause more problems than you really want to get into. Um, so, for example, uh, one of the ones that we do um, in, in the presentation that we do, uh, like I say, it's a four-hour program, and I'm, I'm trying to jam all this stuff together for you. Uh, but one of the things that we do about the Fibets is the one where she, uh, the caregiver says, but your daughter's coming over to, to make supper for you tonight. Uh, oh, she is? Yeah. Um, well, so um, what happens if the daughter doesn't show up? Well, the daughter was never even planning to show up in the first place. She didn't even know that was an option, but you, you've laid the table for that. So you either have to come up with a way of saying something's come up and she's not able to make it to get her out of it, or hope that the short-term memory is compromised enough that they don't remember when they've gotten into that next activity um, that, that the daughter was coming over to fix dinner. And frequently that's what's happened. Frequently what happens is they forget um, that that is there. Um, one of the first ones we start out with is, a, I think it was a bird colonel um, who um, we were taking care of and, and uh, the care caregiver couldn't get him to take a bath. He just wouldn't do it. Not going to take a bath. And um, by taking care of this gentleman, he knew that he was a bird colonel, and he knew that he was, you know, very versed in the military way. And one day he said, you know, he just threw caution to the wind and said, hey, the general's going to be here in 30 minutes for an inspection. You need to be ship -shaped. He said, this guy was naked before he got to the top of the steps. 
built right into the shower and it came right out of the shower and had no memory whatsoever of the fact that it was going to be an inspection. But when he heard those words, he knew exactly what that meant. And that means he's got to have clean fingernails and he's got to get himself ship shape and, and he, was, he was off and going with it. So those are some of the kinds of things that you do based on how well you know the individual um, and, and whether it will work or not. Um, so redirecting um, is a, a good way to do that. So you, you seek to understand what, what's going on and what they need uh, and then redirect them into something else. It could be watching a television program or let's go outside and take a walk in the backyard or let's go walk around. Uh, we had a, a gentleman uh, that lived in a cul-de-sac that had five um, identical um, houses in the cul-de-sac and how he knew which one was his blows my mind because I don't have dementia and when I drove up I went, they're identical. There are five houses are exactly the same house in this curve. <coughs> and how does this man know where he lives? Um, it turns out that they had placed something that only he knew uh, as a, a memory option uh, or, or as a prompt, a memory prompt. Uh, they put something out that when he saw that he knew that was his house. And if it wasn't, if I had taken that particular thing and moved it to somebody else's house, he'd gone right in their house. Hey, y'all, I'm on. <laughs> that would have been a surprise for everybody. Um, but, uh, so that's what you try to do um, for the redirecting or, or distracting. Offering choices. Um, my daughter and uh, her stepmother um, decided to have this uh, running battle on who could make church the worst experience for me uh, in the first year that we were married. Um, and it all had to do with what my daughter wore. And so um, what would happen was uh, my wife would lay out two outfits, or I'm sorry, she would lay an outfit out, and after we had breakfast, it began. And she would say, you need to go put your dress on. And my daughter would bow her back, and she would say, no. And my wife would bow her back, and she'd say, no. And I'd get up and go outside and go, oh, no. Because <laughs> they were going to fight and fight and fight and fight. And on the way to church, we're all sitting in the car. Nobody's speaking to each other except for my son who's sitting in the back. And he's going, this is hysterical. Y'all are so funny. Y'all are just really stupid about this. It was, he, he was the, the, the light in all of that. But by the time we got to church, we were all so angry at each other. We couldn't stand it. Well, except for James. He's still goofy. Um, so I asked a psychologist, and I said, you know what, how, how do I fix this? And she said, well, this is real simple. She said, you just give a choice. Just give a, an A or a B, no C, an A or a B choice. So she goes to the closet, she pulls out two dresses, she lays them out and says to my daughter, go pick what you'd like to wear to church on Sunday. Now, my wife is happy because she's, she's narrowed the field down to something that she thinks my daughter was going to look good in, but my daughter gets to go in, and she gets to make the ultimate choice as to what she's going to go on, go in. I didn't know how to get to church that Sunday. I was kind of like, y'all okay? Really, you're not yelling at each other. What, what's going on here? Um, and it works. And it's the same thing that we do with people who have dementia. You offer them choices. Rather than, uh, um, rather than ask them if they want to do something, you assume that they're going to do it. So comes lunchtime, you don't say, are you hungry, would you like to have lunch? If you have a challenge with that, what you say is, would you rather have turkey or ham for lunch today? Because you're assuming that activity is going to go ahead and happen. And now the choice is turkey or maybe chicken salad or whatever other thing that you pick. Um, rather than the individual exercising the option not to eat, they're exercising the option as to what to eat. Same thing with watching a television program. Uh, we do this at my house. I, I, I want to go to the restaurant before I do the television program. In my house, it's, uh, hey, honey, you want to go out to dinner tonight? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, where do you want to go? Oh, I don't care. Oh, now I'm in for it. <laughs> no, I don't care. Okay, well, what do you say we go to? No, I don't want to do that. I, that's really not hungry for that. Well, what about Italian? No, oh, no, Italian's just way too heavy. I don't, I don't think I want to do Italian. Well, well, okay, what about we go someplace where we can get a good burger? <coughs> too fattening. I'm on a diet. I don't think I can eat a burger. Okay. Um, well, how about uh, you choose something? No, 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 you choose something. Go ahead. And now I've been through half the restaurants in Coleman because there's only about 10 of them there that you can go to. Um, so I use that same approach with my wife now. Instead of saying, would you like to go out to dinner tonight? I go up to her and I say, hey, what do you think about Mexican or barbecue? 
And she bites on that every time. Ooh, Mexican's good. Let's go have Mexican. I think I want barbecue. And every once in a while, she'll throw me a curve and say, what do you think about going to Sweet Peppers and having a good salad? Oh, I think that's a great idea because I really don't care. I'm just grateful to get to eat, you know? Um, so um, it's the same thing in dealing with somebody that has dementia and has a difficult behavior to match. You give them two options. And those options can be, do you want to play this puzzle? Or how about we watch this channel on television? It's not, what would you like to do next? It's not an open-ended question. It's a closed question. It's a question uh, that gets them to pick something that then gives them the ability uh, to have a, a part in the decision, but still not have to, to think of too much stuff. Who's been to Starbucks lately? Anybody? Have you ever tried to order a cup of coffee? Yeah, try it. Be prepared to giggle. <laughs> well, you don't have to like it. It's just, you know, I'd like to have a cup of coffee. And then the questions, here they come. Well, you want calf or decaf? Well, I don't care. Uh, well, you want this, that, and the other. Not, you know, I just want a cup of coffee. You can't do that at Starbucks. They have too many options. Um, and, and, and that's the way a person with dementia feels. When you ask them a question, there, if there are too many answers, rather than answer, sometimes they just shut down. They don't respond at all. And now you're left not having any clue. Um, apologize. Have you ever tried to argue with somebody who agrees with you? <laughs> it's tough, isn't it? Um, see, nobody's arguing with me. <laughs> um, and, and so what happens there, you're not taking blame for it, but you're diffusing the situation by accepting some level of responsibility in that transaction. So that may well be where you say something like, um, can I help you button that sweater? No, no, I'll get it. I can take care of it all by myself. Oh, I'm sure you can, Mr. Jones. I'm fine with that. Um, so she apologized by saying, sure you can. I'm sorry, I misunderstood you. Those are kinds of things that you can use that just takes all the steam out of the argument because they're not going to argue with you, uh, generally. So you apologize, but you don't necessarily accept responsibility. Uh, in our particular case, it's a person that's gone missing. She's stolen my purse. Well, you know, the, the conversation could go something like, have you seen my purse? I have not, but you know what? This could be fun. Let's go room to room, see if we can find it. Then you get the person up out of the chair and you start going room to room to find it. Uh, you can turn it into an activity. Um, or you can get other people to look for. It could be that it's just sitting right there out of her sight. Um, you could say something to the effect of, uh, would you like for me to come look, or could you take a little closer look at your chair and see if maybe it got kicked under the chair? Oh, there it is. Those kinds of things happen. So um, I know y'all are getting kind of antsy because time is running. So um, engaging the client in a meaningful activity. So if I'm an individual um, that enjoys, liking, enjoys watching football and you ask me, hey, you want to watch football? Most likely I'm going to want to watch football. But if I can't stand football, or golf, golf puts me to sleep. If you want me to take a nap, turn on a golf channel, okay? Because that's going to happen. So um, with, with an individual um, who's in that particular position, um, if you know an activity that's meaningful to them and you can engage them in it, most likely a lot easier since you know that it's something that they're interested in. So don't ask them, you know, you want to help me fold laundry? <laughs> yeah, really? Yeah. Because most men don't like to fold laundry. Some guys do like to fold laundry, and it could be a meaningful activity because uh, it's very calming if you do it the right way. Um, and there's some other things, but what I'll say to you is when you're dealing with an individual that has um, some behavioral issues, the quicker you can get to them, the quicker the situation is going to be re resolved. We typically say in 30 seconds, that's a long time if somebody's throwing a fit. If you can get to them in 15 seconds to get the conversation started, you can de-escalate what's going on and have the whole situation over with in 30 seconds as opposed to going on for two hours during the day. Um, and finally, whatever you try, if it doesn't work, try something else. You know? And if that doesn't work, then try a combination of other things, but keep trying because it doesn't work all the time, but they all work. Every single time they will work but not in the same combinations. I'd love to answer any questions that you have about uh, managing difficult behaviors. Um, 
or be a resource to you through Home Instead Senior Care. Yes, ma'am.